Thank you very much for the invitation to the neuropsychiatry, which uh, I started out in psychiatry in the, in the 90s of last uh, century, and there the biological psychiatry wasn't as developed. And I tried sort of to bridge the gap uh, between psychiatry and neurology, between brain and mind, and ultimately also philosophy, because you heard I have a background in that uh, regard. And one of the phenomenon when you enter as a resident in, clin in, in, the, in the clinic, of course you see sometimes some strange cases. You already had a lot of wonderful case histories uh, in the prior talk. And some of the phenomena which inspired me was that you see these catatonic patients. And catatonia, I will show you, is a, is a very bizarre disorder. And it's probably, of course, everybody says it who deals with the subject, probably one of the most bizarre disorders, but at least. And then, of course, you go back into the history of catatonia. When you go into psychiatry, you know there has been a lot of uh, discussion <clears throat> um, uh, how to classify symptoms, uh, whether it's a syndrome, or whether it's a category, or whether it's a dimensional approach, or whether it's an entity. And that has really been condensed in the case of catatonia. And that's why I uh, go a little bit into the history very quick of catatonia to give you an appre uh, appreciation where we are now. Um, catatonia was originally described by German uh, psychiatrist <coughs> Karl Karlbaum uh, back in the 19th century, 1871. And when you read the original description, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful description of the various symptoms. He described behavioral symptoms, motor symptoms, and strong affective symptoms. I will get back to that. And he considered, as far as you can see it out of his uh, monography, catatonia, really sort of as a syndrome. It, it can occur in association with schizophrenia, but it can also occur in association with affective psychosis. But you have to remember that at those times, in 1871, the diagnostic classifications of affective psychosis, schizophrenia, psychosis, and all that was not really there yet. So psychiatry was really in its very, very, very early stages. Uh, that changed at the beginning of the 20th century when uh, two further uh, German psychiatrists came on the scene, um, <clears throat> uh, Emil Kreplin and uh, Eugen Bleuler, and Bloß uh, both focused on schizophrenia and described schizophrenia, or Kreplin in the case, uh, he described it as uh, dementia precox, but that's basically what we, in a rough sense, uh, understand under schizophrenia. And that had strong implications. Let me go for the next slide. That has had strong implications for uh, the classification of catatonia, because they subsumed catatonia under schizophrenia. And that was the predominant, and that basically, that view prevailed. So catatonia was considered to be a subtype of schizophrenia. And you can see it, I uh, roughly indicated here, so you have a catatonic syndrome. Catatonia was basically considered a motor manifestation of schizophrenia. And you see that already somehow uh, cut two essential dimensions of catatonia, the behavioral and the affective dimensions. And then, of course, obviously, uh, they considered a particular broiler considered schizophrenia as a disorder of the self or as an ego disorder. Uh, um, so it's a basic disorder of the self. Another, yet another German psychiatrist, Josef Batze, really saw schizophrenia as a disorder of the self. And if there's time, I will come back to that. Um, and then obviously the para, uh, paranoid hallucinatory syndrome. Um, but Though at the same time there were also some counter movements, like another German psychiatrist, Lange and Kirby here in US, uh, associated catatonia rather with affective disorders, emphasizing the strong affective component with either depression or even mania. Uh, but that view somehow receded in the back until some 20, 30 years ago, 
uh, when sort of it was observed that catatonic syndrome uh, also associated with, uh, can also be associated with affective disorders, depression, and mania. And to make things even worse and more complex, you see catatonia is a nightmare when you go into the history, um, is that catatonia can also be observed in various organic disorders. You can have it with stroke, you can have it with various uh, endocrine disorders, and I did a lot of uh, consultation liaison. I saw many patients, as I said, with medical disorders, and particular also with uh, HIV, I saw many. So the current state of the art is really that catatonia is really a syndrome. It's a common final functional pathway, as for instance, fever. Fever is a reaction to some changes, to various changes in, uh, in the body. It's a common final functional pathway. And I would consider uh, catatonia in the same way. It's a common final functional pathway, sort of is a reaction pattern, which, of course, obviously, I will show you later some slides, is related to particular changes in the brain. But even more important, and I will demonstrate that too, with particular intrapsychological experiences. So it is always coupled with that. Um, so that basically describes in the current uh, psychiatric classification, DSM-4, uh, and there is a uh, DSM-5 to be developed soon, coming out soon. Uh, catatonia somehow moves away from schizophrenia. There's a classifier under affective disorders, but it hasn't really been uh, fully classified yet as a syndrome yet. And I would say in the same way you classified the delusions with various disorders, uh, in the same way it is with catatonia. And that is important to consider also the rich uh, symptomatic variety. And that is very important in turn to understand the patients and to give the right treatment. So let me go... Um, that, so we did a lot of research into that. Uh, I cannot, unfortunately, I cannot offer any nice uh, case history, some patient telling what he experiences during catatonia because they all speak in German, because I uh, <laughs> did a lot of my research in Germany. And this also hints to another point. Catatonia is relatively rare. The full-blown catatonic picture uh, is relatively rare. There's an incidence of 2 to 3 percent these days. Um, in former times, before the introduction of neuroleptics, it was much more often. And that's exactly where this nice picture is derived from. This picture is uh, from the textbook of psychiatry from Kreplin, as I said, who was the first one uh, who subsumed catatonia as a motor manifestation of schizophrenia. And you can already see very typical uh, symptoms here. You can see this is sort of this bizarre posturing, so people don't move anymore. So they suffer from an akinasia. So that really mirrors what you see in Parkinson's disease. This is one of my initial reasons why I studied this, is really where a psychiatric condition mimics a neurologic condition. So I reverse the title of this symposium. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but there is much more. And uh, when you compare the Parkinsonian akinasia, you never have an akinasia against, against the gravity. And that's the uh, difference in the posturing. You see, this is against gravity. Everybody of us would get tired after one hour. These people don't. So these people, particularly in those times before the introduction of neuroleptics, they postured for days, weeks, months, and sometimes even years. Yeah? And they did not get tired by that, which is very strange. Yeah, so this goes completely against the motor physiology, and that already tells you, uh, as I will show later, it's not a primary motor disorder. So this is one essential thing. The other thing you have in Parkinson's disease, uh, you have the typical Cockville rigidity, and you have sort of an analogous but slightly different symptom in the catatonic patients, it's called flexibilitas seria. Uh, so this is basically sort of a smooth resistance, a hypertonus, but it's not the typical cockwheel-like rigidity. So there's again a superficial similarity 
But when you go deeper into more detail, there's a, a difference. And that's probably due to the difference in origin, as I would argue. It's a, in Parkinson's disease, the primary motor disorder coming from the nicrostriatal uh, dopaminergic pathway, the basal ganglia, leading up to the cortex, whereas in catatonia, it might rather be the other way around. It might rather become primarily from the cortex and downmodulate the basal ganglia. But I will come back to that later. So these are the sort of C, uh, uh, one of the main motor symptoms. But you don't only have hypokinetic motor symptoms, but you can have also hyperkinetic motor symptoms. So this is very important. So this is often neglected. Uh, the classical, of course, you, uh, you, you, they don't move, they have akinasia, they have posturing, like this, but they can have also the opposite, too many movement, hyperkinesia. So, so sort of you have movement excitation. And that can be sort of, uh, can erupt suddenly out of an akinetic state. So you can change that. Um, it's less rare, uh, but it, it still occurs quite often. Um, the other thing, obviously, which everybody knows, catatonic patients don't speak. They are uh, mutistic. So that's where the differential diagnosis is akinetic mutism, which you can have with lesions in the motor part of the anterior cingulate cortex. But again, as I said, akinetic mutistic patients, they don't have this typical uh, posturing, the mutism. And another thing which you clinically, when you observe clinically very careful, the catatonic patients, most of them are sort of hyper aware. They're very vigilant. They have increased arousal. They are very, you have the feeling that they're very tense. And at, at every moment, they could break out. Um, that leads yet to another domain. So sort of, that's the motor domain, then the behavioral domain. This is often neglected. Posturing is really at the uh, border between motor and behavioral domains. Behavioral domains, they can uh, show, um, they can display all kinds of very strange behavior. Uh, the most strange sort of the echopraxia and echolalia. So they can sort of mimic your gestures. So if I do this, the patient does the same. Uh, echolalia, you know, they uh, repeat everything what you say. Um, and they can also uh, follow you. So they uh, mitmachen, mitgehen, I think uh, it's called in German, and I think it's the same called in English as far as I understand. So what does that mean? So they follow you everywhere. It's very strange. So I had two catatonic patients at the same time in my ward, and they followed me everywhere throughout the whole hospital. Uh, and, and at the time, so when I was a resident, I was uh, also in charge for the, for the building across the street. So no problem, they followed me there too. Uh, and the doctors, which were internal medical doctors on that side of the street, they thought, I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and you could not convince them. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a very strange thing. Yeah. Um, you can see those kinds of symptoms also with isolated neurological lesions, but I'm not aware of particular lesion locations there. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> let me just, yeah, so the question is, and then the next thing is, of course, the strong affective component. We had this nice case of Cotard syndrome, which I'm sure he already displayed certain catatonic syndrome, and that leads to a very important thing. The psychomotor alterations, the motor alterations are secondary to affective experience. So if you experience extreme anxiety, yeah, of course, every stimulus from the additional stimulus from the outside world enhances your anxiety. So what do you do to avoid that? You become catatonic so that you don't have to react anymore. Yeah? And this is sort of an interpretation. We ask many of these patients afterwards. So what did you experience during this strange, during this catatonic episode? And 75% of these patients uh, told me that they experience extreme, and that is important, uncontrollable anxiety. They weren't able to control their anxiety. So this anxiety can be due to 
extreme delusions. If, you, uh, if I constantly have the feeling that you put thoughts into my head, of course I'm getting afraid, and then I may become catatonic. Uh, but also, it can also be part of the post-traumatic stress disorder. I saw many cases with catatonia following a PTSD when they had nightmares. And the main, of course, you will see that affective patients with affective disorders, depression, mania, schizophrenia, PTSD, they all have affective abnormalities, yes. But the distinguishing criteria was really that they could not control their emotions. And when I mean control, it's in a very subjective way. They weren't able to get any grip to control and uh, uh, um, modulate their emotions anymore. So they were completely over flooded. Um, so, <clears throat> and like the Kotar syndrome, of course, if you have the, uh, if you experience yourself as dead, of course you don't move anymore. So what we observed in most of the cases, catatonia was sort of, a, the catatonic reaction was sort of a secondary reaction to some intra-psychological experience. And that's very important. Um, but it must not only be negative emotional experience. I had a patient who came five times, and every time she came in a full-blown hypocatatonic state with posturing, with mutism, with extreme anxiety, you could see it, um, when she fell in love. Uh, so each time she had a new partner, uh, after a couple of months, she became catatonic, and came to our unit. It was really tragic, yeah. Um, and as I said, many manic patients can also develop catatonia. So it really seems to be sort of a common final functional pathway where sort of the, um, the ability of the brain to react to the outside world is sort of comes to an end and that's the only way it can sort of somehow preserve um, uh, some uh, degree of stability. So I hope that makes clear that when you consider catatonia, don't look only for motor symptoms. Look also for behavioral abnormalities. As I said, echopraxia, echolalia. Uh, look for the motor abnormalities in a, in a distinct way from Parkinson. There is a superficial resemblance, but as I said, look for instance for the flexibilitas serea and look also for affective abnormalities. Um, but as I said, catatonia is complex. Uh, you also have catatonia sort of uh, a non-affective type of catatonia, if you want to say so, which is strongly associated with particular chronic schizophrenia. Patients with neg strong negative symptoms, blunted affect or disorganization, uh, lack of uh, initiative, poverty of speak, poverty of thought, they also might sort of gradually slip into the uh, catatonic state. And <clears throat> but that's usually, probably depends on the setting. If you're sort of in a, in, a, in a chronic rehabilitation home, then you probably see more of the latter. If you're in an inpatient unit, uh, you probably see more of the former, the affective type. So you already see that catatonia is a very complex uh, disorder, shows affective motor uh, behavioral symptoms type, and usually the diagnosis of catatonia, um, there's of course, as you can imagine, uh, as many investigators, as many suggestions for the diagnosis of catatonia, but usually you need more than one symptom. Each of the symptoms is by itself unspecific. We had it this morning. Um, there's, as in the case of schizophrenia and epilepsy, no symptom of schizophrenia is specific and can occur only in schizophrenia. Because it somehow mirrors, mirrored in other neurological disorders, as for instance, epilepsy. Same in catatonia. So you will see many, some single symptoms in many patients, uh, um, but you really have to have this and we put it this way, this constellation of behavioral affective and behavioral abnormalities. Um, what, why does this catatonia come about? Uh, 
So I show you a couple of uh, uh, neurobiological studies which we conducted. There's unfortunately not much neurobiological research in catatonia uh, because there's simply, um, it's very hard to study and it's very rare these days, yeah? Because fortunately due to the introduction of the neuroleptics, it seems to be prevented from occurring. So how to start neurobiological research in these patients? Uh, one of the ways is, where, as I said, we conducted an extensive study where we investigated the patient, where we compared the subjective experience of catatonic patients after the episode with those of Parkinson's patients. So, and as I said, one of the main features came, which came out of the study was uh, that the catatonic patients were unable to control their emotions. And sort of the hypothesis is or was that uh, maybe there's an abnormal linkage between emotions and motor functions in the brain. Yeah, because it seems to be that an abnormally intense uh, emotional experience transforms into these abnormal uh, movements. And so what we did in functional imaging in orientation sort of on this subjective clinical phenomenology, we developed a paradigm where subjects uh, viewed uh, emotions and at the same time had to perform a mortar task to uh, uh, do a, a button press. And these are earlier studies. This is uh, oh, in the earlier time of the studies. So what you could see here, and uh, we already mentioned uh, one particular region in the uh, anterior medial prefrontal cortex, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, perigenal anterior cingulate. You mentioned that this is part of the default mode, which shows high resting state activity. And we already mentioned that also in the, in the first talk by Dr. Black. Um, so, and this is basically, you can see here, I know it's uh, difficult to see, uh, as I said, these are earlier uh, studies. You can see here in the healthy subjects, so they got an emotional stimulation, and you see uh, some activity changes here, uh, and activity changes also in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Why are they white and uh, black? This is important because in white, you see particularly what we call an fMRI negative signal changes, so deactivation. Uh, the reason is, because these midline regions show very high activity in the resting state when you don't do anything. Maybe when you relax yourself nicely now and don't listen much to me, you have high resting state activity here. Uh, I hope so. And, uh, and when you have a stimulus coming, it uh, sort of lowers the activity, and that's what we call an fMRI deactivation or negative signal changes. Whereas in lateral prefrontal cortex, you have positive change. So you have sort of inverse opposite signal pattern in medial prefrontal cortex and lateral prefrontal cortex. And so, as I said, the, the deactivation is indicated by the white voxels here and the activations by the black voxels. And you can see in the catatonic patients, you don't see, you neither see white nor black. Sort of this inverse pattern between medial and lateral prefrontal cortex seems to be out of tune. It's disbalanced, yeah? So basically the emotional stimulus does not modulate these two regions in, uh, together anymore. So, and what we did here, <coughs> and uh, this is, uh, <coughs> so here, these are the signal changes. Um, and the question is now, you might want to raise, how do I distinguish between the, um, between the underlying disorders and the catatonic syndrome? This is indeed a very difficult case to make. Um, so what we did here is we uh, had catatonic patients which had an underlying diagnosis of affective disorder, depression, or schizophrenia, paranoid, hallucinatory schizophrenia. And we grouped the, our total sample of patients in two different ways. Either we grouped it according to the presence and absence of catatonic. So we had uh, catatonia, 
on the basis of e depression and schizophrenia versus non-catatonia, schizophrenic and depressed patients. Or we grouped our sample according to schizophrenia and depression across catatonia. And what we could show in this is what you see here. So all catatonic patients, independent of whether depression or schizophrenia, showed a significant decrease in the signal changes, particularly here in the midline regions, in the anterior midline regions. So the emotions, apparently, they were not able to properly uh, uh, change these regions' activity. Whereas the psychiatric controls, which I said as I were effective in schizophrenic patients, were to some degree so diminished when compared to the healthy subject, they were able to do so. So, and this region did not show up when we compared the schizophrenic versus the affective patients across the catatonia. So that was sort of our conclusion that maybe that is really specific for the catatonic syndrome. So now you might say, yes, that may explain some of the emotional abnormalities, but what about the motor abnormalities? Uh, as you may know, the motor cortex is the central region for initiating and executing movement in the cortex. So you might hypothesize that maybe there's an abnormal connection between the uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, this region I just showed, uh, with the premotor and the motor cortex. You remember that Dr. Black described some uh, connectivity between the hippocampus and the prefrontal, and connectivity basically means we are in contact with each other. So basically, my activity in the medial prefrontal cortex is in tune temporally with the activity in the premotor cortex. So there is synchronization, or as she described it this morning by the example of the schizophrenic patients, that sort of the activity of the one region entrains the activity of the other regions. So, and that is exactly what we tested here for. So, uh, so we looked for the activity in these two regions, and you could clearly uh, see that uh, um, in the healthy subjects, we found uh, functional connectivity so that the two regions were somehow in tune, and in catatonic patients, this was abnormally disturbed. So my, of course, now you might say, why do they have disturbed functional connectivity when they have an abnormal connection between emotion and motor symptom? I cannot tell you that's the secret of the brain. So, <clears throat> But it is clear that there is some change, particular in the emotional motor pathway in catatonia. And that that, and we correlated that with the degree of the motor symptoms, and it indeed correlated. So the question is, um, uh, where does this come from? And that, I will go for that to the, uh, refer for that um, to, my, to the second part of my talk. Um, but the other question you might want to ask about the therapy of catatonia. Um, what, how shall we treat them? You have a patient who did not move, who does not move, who does not speak, who may posture in a uh, bizarre way. What do you do? So one of the central things, and it has been shown very effective, is benzodiazepines, particular lorazepam particularly use lorazepam, don't use va uh, uh, va volume. Use lorazepam and uh, short acting and give it either orally or intravenously. And many, two thirds of the catatonic patients react very well to that. So you can really say, okay, if you give it, particular if you give it intravenously, um, you can have sort of a, within half an hour, they might recover and be able to speak again. So this is one of the few instances where you can really uh, do a very effective immediate treatment in catatonic syndrome. Uh, highly recommended. 
uh, if it does not work orally, try intravenously. Um, and if that does not work, uh, if you try it multiple times, um, then you might want to try some uh, glutamatergic drugs, particularly like ketamine or amantadine. You may know that ketamine has been used re most recently very much in depression. Uh, how that is related to the effectiveness in catatonia is unclear. You may know that amantadine was at some point, as far as I know, also used in Parkinson's disease, um, and it has a strong dopaminergic component. There is not much experience for purely dopaminergic drugs in catatonia. So unlike in Parkinson's disease, these do not seem to work. Of course, there are some exceptions, but the majority of cases uh, does not support such a view. So that's really another difference to Parkinson's disease. Um, and then, of course, treat the underlying disorder. Uh, treat the depression. Uh, some cases have been shown that serotonergic drugs relieve the depression and then also the catatonic syndrome. Uh, but the really full-blown catatonic syndrome is, uh, really needs uh, benzodiazepine. Benzodiazepine work particularly well for the hypo hypokinetic form. The hyperkinetic form, when you really have these crazy movements, uh, is very difficult to treat. Then you just have to sedate people. Yeah? The extremely well therapeutic effectiveness of Laura the Palm in these patients goes well along with the strong affective component, which, as I said, in the 19th, uh, beginning of 20th century has really been, though there were by Kirby and Lange studies showing the strong association of catatonia with affective disorder, both mania and depression, has really revived over the last 20, 30 years. And that goes well with the good therapeutic efficiency of benzodiazepine, in particular lorazepam. Why lorazepam and not other benzodiazepines, I don't know. Lorazepam is very short acting, uh, has a particular subunit configuration when compared to other benzodiazepines, but it's really unclear. But it's clear that lorazepam has a special efficiency. So <clears throat> that uh, <clears throat> is the question, why does it show such a good effect? So, of course, you all know that lorazepam, benzodiazepine, act at the GABA-A receptor. The GABA-A receptor is a complex amalgam of different proteins, subunits, and there's also the sort of one subunit is called the benzodiazepine <laughs> subunit, and that's exactly where the lorazepam uh, is bound to. So, of course, you might assume, since you have this really dramatic effect, everybody who observes the effects of law as a palm in catatonic patients is really an experience, not only for the patient, also for the clinician. And <clears throat> so you would assume there must be some changes in the GABA-A receptor. And so this is something we uh, tested. The first thing, what we did in these patients, we did that in the post-acute state in the scanner. So we gave them law of the palm in the scanner versus placebo. And we wanted to see how the brain reacts to law of the palm during emotional stimulation. So we had again emotional stimulation, and then they received law of the palm. And you would assume that the law of the palm normalizes their activity during emotional stimulation. And that's exactly what you can see here. You remember that the previous slide, there were no white voxels here, no black voxels here, and the law of the palm normalized that. So it really seems to be uh, these regions are strongly involved, it's again the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, are strongly involved in emotional processing, and they seem to be strongly modulated by GABA. And I will come back to that. And that goes with the clinical experience that GABA, if you have strong affective symptoms, 
even in acute depression, when an acute, very agitated, depressed patient came to me, I usually like to give Laura the pump. So not as a long-term treatment, but sort of to relieve the patient and to open the door for sort of a therapeutic alliance with the patient. And imagine you come on the ward and within two hours you at least feel a temporary relief of your symptoms. You have much more confidence and trust into the uh, uh, therapeutic setting. And that's very important then for subsequent uh, psychotherapeutic uh, measures. And you see that in placebo you don't see such a reaction. I did not show the healthy subjects. The healthy subjects, very interesting, show exactly the opposite pattern. When you give the healthy subjects the law of the palm, they show this pattern. Because in us, the law of the palm, when you get law of the palm, you are sedated, you get sleepy. Uh, so it's exactly the opposite effect what you see in catatonic patients. Yeah? And that may be due to this altered reactivity of the uh, GABAergic system. So now you might say, yeah, if there's altered reactivity to law of the palm and inverse in healthy and uh, catatonic patients, then you would assume, yeah, there must indeed be some changes in the GABA-A receptors. And again, that is something one can test. Um, so you can test that with uh, particular, uh, with uh, uh, SPECT uh, single photon emission tomography or PET positron emission tomography. Unfortunately, we had at the time only available SPECT. And you can use particular radioactive substances like uh, uh, 123 yod humazenil, which binds specifically to the GABA-A receptor and sort of uh, visualizes that. So you see here, this is the healthy subject. This is the cortex. And you see everywhere where it is red, you see uh, that's where this substance has uh, bound to the GABA-A receptors, so that means the more red, the more GABA-A receptors. No surprise in visual cortex, when you look at this talk, your GABA-A receptors are very active. So because you have plenty of GABA-A receptors in the visual cortex, and you can see here also in the prefrontal cortex. So basically this gives you sort of the density of the GABA-A receptors. And, and you can see here the psychiatric controls. These are the uh, uh, non-catatonic, depressed, and schizophrenic patients. And you can see nicely uh, they have a more or less preserved density of their GABA-A receptors, here in prefrontal as well as in visual cortex. These are the post-acute catatonic patients, and you see a severe deficit in GABA-A receptors. So this is indeed very interesting here. Particular, this is the prefrontal cortex. This is exactly the region where they showed deficits during emotional stimulation. Um, these investigations, uh, the, as I said, there are not many systematic uh, studies on, uh, on catatonic patients since, because it's such a rare field, and, uh, they're not, and it's very difficult also to scan them. Uh, and in Canada, since I'm in Canada, I'm since three years in Canada, I haven't encountered so many catatonic patients yet. So, but that really shows maybe the affective disturbance is related to ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and that in turn may be somehow related to abnormal GABA-A receptors. So now you want to sort of say, um, you would like to do the same with ketamine or amantadine, which has also been uh, therapeutic effect, uh, effective in catatonia, though in a more delayed way. So when you give lorazepam, you see immediate effects. When you, if lorazepam doesn't work, as I said, you can try amantadine or ketamine, but you have sort of a more delayed profile over several days of therapeutic recovery and obviously treat the underlying disorder. So let's come back to the, um, the linkage between this region and GABA, because this is not only relevant for catatonia, but also very relevant for depression. Uh, as you know, Helen Mayberg conducted uh, wonderful earlier studies, is 
in, uh, with PET and the metabolism, which showed increased uh, resting state activity in these regions, in exactly those regions which are also here affected in the catatonic syndrome. So that really uh, puts the whole thing, it's not only important for catatonia, but important for understanding the brain function in general, how GABA modulates neural activity in this region, and that in turn is very important for the emotional processing, which is strongly affected in depression and various other disorders. So this is why we then uh, conducted yet another study, another way, uh, how, and this gives you an example how you can and need to combine the different imaging modalities. So I sh so far showed you fMRI, the scanning, you know all these colorful dots and spots, which everybody shows you. And uh, I showed you some, uh, the receptor binding uh, imaging techniques, PET and SPECT. Now I introduce you to yet another technique. Um, this is, here you see it on the right. This is the magnetic resonance spectroscopy, short MRS. And <clears throat> with that, you can measure the, thank you very much, here it's 14. Uh, with that, you can measure the, uh, <clears throat> the concentration of glutamate, uh, glutamine, and GABA. So basically, and you know that GABA and glutamate are the main players, the main transmitters in the cortex. So this allows you to differentiate between GABA and glutamate. Okay, so what we did here, we did in the same subject, uh, we again focused sort of on this ventromedial prefrontal cortex, particularly the perigenial anterior cingulate cortex down here. The box is where we measured the glutamate and uh, GABA. And again, you can see now in a much nicer way, you can see the deactivation. As I said, these regions have high resting state activity. And when the stimulus comes during emotion perception and judgment, you see particularly deactivation. And this is exactly what you get. And the question is now, is this deactivation related to GABA or to glutamate? And our results could clearly show, let me just get the whole thing, that it is clearly related to GABA, but not to glutamate. So meaning, the higher the concentration of GABA in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the stronger deactivation are induced in the very same uh, region during emotional processing. The question, of course, is now, is GABA specifically tuned to emotional processing in that region? Or does GABA modulate any kind of neural activity in that region, independent of emotional processing? So this is obviously the subject of future studies. That is very clinically also very relevant, so that it is clear that maybe laws upon either you have a wider spectrum of uh, clinical, possi possible clinical therapeutic effects of laws upon or not, and for which kind of disorders you can use it, so that you can really use it in a sort of, as I would say, in a, in a brain-based way. So, but that's obviously that's subject to, uh, subject to future studies. Um, so, as I said, <clears throat> Catatonia, and I think, and that's why I was very happy when I got the mail for the invitation. I think catatonia is really a psychomotor disorder. I think our investigations and others' investigations really quote, catatonia is not a motor disorder. And that was a mistake of Kreplin, who subsumed it just as a motor disorder of schizophrenia. Catatonia is much more. Catatonia is a psychomotor, affective motor, behavioral motor disorder. It's particular sort of the, the bridge between the emotional and the motor component. The bridge itself is somehow altered in a way. But this is also important. Catatonia is not a pure deficit, as many of these symptoms you see in neurology and in psychiatry is rather a, an achievement on a low level, admittedly. It's a compensatory strategy to cope with certain changes in the brain slash the intrapsychological experience. So it's like fever. Like fever is also an achievement. It's a compensatory strategy, somehow to maintain a certain stability. 
And uh, if you even want to go further, we had it this morning between brain and mind. Uh, I think the case of catatonia tells us that maybe our distinction between brain and mind uh, is superfluous. If the brain, just imagine, little thought experiment by the philosopher, if the brain could listen to us, if the brain would sit there and listen to us, it would probably smile if it hears us talking about brain and mind. Because that, come on, I don't think in these, if the brain would say this, yeah? Uh, you see how much difficulties I have, <laughs> yeah? Um, um, the brain would smile and said, these dichotomies don't apply to me. So maybe we as outside observers need these dichotomies. But we should not impose them upon the brain and how we investigate the brain and how we understand our patients. This is the lesson I learned from these patients and many other patients. So this is why I guide my uh, scanning investigations by what the patients experience. So meaning this question may be sort of an artifact of our mind slash brain. Yeah? But it's really, and I think that is where uh, neuropsychiatry uh, is really, and I think this is a wonderful development that really the two disciplines uh, come very close together, neurology and uh, uh, psychiatry. And all we can do is really look at the patients, listen to the patients, and mind the gap between mind and brain. Thank you very much.